From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. We've had a lot of inquiries from viewers and listeners about Pastor Clay's absence. Pastor Clay was involved in a quite serious traffic accident. But through God's strength, he's on the mend and will be back in the pulpit soon. The Stevens and Cross Culture families both thank you for your prayers and concern. Now let's get on with this week's message. Countless distractions threaten to steal the love of Christ and reorient it to some unprofitable, worldly focus. Rather than drink the sweet wine of heavenly treasure and things, our time this morning, we're going to focus on Psalm 145. In this psalm, it's one that God leads us to consider the heavenly things. This week, our guest speaker is from our cross-culture family as well. Here's Dr. Eric Clary. For uh, those of you who may be visiting today, my name is Eric Clary. Uh, I'm not the pastor here, the senior pastor. Our senior pastor, Clay Stevens, uh, continues to convalesce at home after a horrific uh, vehicular accident, uh, what, six, seven, eight weeks ago. Clay still is uh, pretty much confined to a lazy boy having to keep his foot elevated and all, and I'm certain that that is uh, a challenge, uh, knowing Clay and his burden for God's people, uh, wanting, I'm sure, to every week uh, deliver that which would be profitable for its people. And so, uh, interestingly enough, even uh, this week, Clay, from his lazy boy, pins his pastor's perspective as he's reflecting on his uh, Uh, Just on his uh, situation, Clay tells us, I choose a spiritual perspective. I choose to look at my circumstances from an eternal perspective and not a temporal perspective because this is the only way God is glorified and the only way I can thrive in any circumstances. And so Clay brings into the conversation Paul in his letter to the Colossians where Paul says, set your mind on the things above and not on the things of earth. As Paul reminds us, the things of God are key. We are to keep our focus on God, but the reality is that often that's not the case, right? Why is it that we need to be reminded to keep our focus on the things of God? I think pure and simple, it's just so easy to get off track, is it not? Countless distractions threaten to steal the love of Christ and reorient it to some unprofitable, worldly focus. Rather than drink the sweet wine of heavenly treasure and things, right? Instead, what? We fill ourselves with the grog of worldliness. This is not a novel issue, right, for the church today. It's not that all of a sudden this cropped up. Again, from Paul's letter to the Colossians, it's clear that even the early church They had that struggle. When you read uh, the letter to the church in Ephesus, Christ speaking to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, Christ says, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And so Jesus tells him, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things as you did at first. So the church then and the church today, we struggle with the dichotomy of love. Love for Christ pitted against love for the world and its distractions. And the solution Christ presents there in the book of Revelation is what? First of all, to remember, and then repent, and then do. But first of all, to remember. Remember the height from which you've fallen, to remember. The Scripture gives us plenty of resources to assist us in this effort, to remember. And then our time this morning, we're going to focus on Psalm 145. In this psalm, it's one that's attributed to David, one of about 73 or so of the 150 psalms. God leads us to consider the heavenly things. And so reading Psalm 145, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. 
One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom. They speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generation. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked, all the wicked, he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature, every creature, Praise his holy name forever and ever. This particular psalm, Psalm 145, a fairly lengthy one, yes. It is arranged in what's called an acrostic. You can't tell that working in your English translation. An acrostic would be something like, um, say, uh, uh, MAD, M-A-D-D, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, where the first letter of each word taken together in line, signifies something, right? In this case, the acrostic of Psalm 145, the first letters spell out the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 in all, two of them in verse 13. And so in the first verse I've circled, you see the Hebrew letter Aleph, the first letter in the alphabet. In the second verse, Beit, and then Gimel in the third. Just in its very form, this psalm delivers to us a challenge. An acrostic, for, for all that an acrostic can be used to do to convey various meanings, at the very least, an acrostic, it's a mnemonic device. It is something that is intended to assist in our memorization. God intends that we take his word and that we memorize scripture, right? And so the psalmist says elsewhere what? Thy word have I hid in my heart, and with a purpose, that I might not sin against thee. And so immediately the psalm challenges us. Are we memorizing scripture? Or is that just something for the kids when they go to Miss Quarles, when they go to see two kids? Surely we agree, man, this is a, it's a great thing for children to take in the word of God, for them to memorize it. And indeed it is. But we, did we just stop that, you know, when we you know, graduated to youth group or something? Or maybe beyond? Are we taking time to take in God's word and memorize it just in this form, the psalm begins to challenge, and the challenge doesn't let up there. In this psalm, several things come to mind, the first of which is that rightly ordered praise, again, this is a, this is a pray, this, this psalm it is, a, uh, it is a hymn of praise, and in it we find that rightly ordered praise, it has an object, the one being praised, okay? The object is a Who? And not just any who, right? The object is God Almighty. Okay? Ten times in this psalm, the psalmist identifies who's being praised, and it is Yahweh. Right? Yahweh, that's the name that God uses to tell Moses. When Moses is given the charge, God tells Moses, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to lead the Hebrews out of captivity and take them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Right? Moses was a bit intimidated by the task, and he just starts this laundry list of reasons why somehow he's just not the man for the job. And so one of his questions, if you will, 
is, okay, Lord, suppose I go back and I tell the Hebrews that I'm here to lead them out of captivity. Well, what if they say, well, who is this God that you claim has given you this charge? And God responds to Moses with the revelation of a name that he's given to none other before, not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob. The name is Yahweh. And it means I am who I am. So God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent, you to, has sent me to you. God reveals to Moses something about his character. A name means something. I've got a nephew who unfortunately at a very young age got tagged with the nickname Stinky. You know, names mean something, and I'm sure, pretty sure that he's uh, content to put that in the past. Names mean something. God's name means something. There are many names that God uses, that God reveals in Scripture to describe himself. Yahweh is important. I am who I am. Somewhere along the line, the Jews decided, that, man, this name is so holy, we cannot even speak it. And so in the Hebrew text, where the letters, the consonants for Yahweh were written, as the Jews would recite that passage, when they came to that name, they wouldn't say Yahweh. No, they substituted another name, Adonai. In your English translation, if you've got like the NIV, NASB, whatever, you'll see Lord written in small caps. Where you see that, that is the name Yahweh. I am who I am. He is the self-existent one. He is the self-sufficient one. God's existence depends on no one. He exists in and of himself. He's wholly contained within himself. He's separate from his creation. He's not his creation. His creation is not him. He is the self-existent one, and it's by his mighty hand that he tells Moses, I'm going to lead these people out of captivity. It's not the Pharaoh is going to all of a sudden just come to his senses and have a change of heart and say, you know, yeah, it really is wrong to be oppressing these, you know, two million people. The Hebrews aren't going to be let out of Egypt by the goodwill of the Egyptians. No, they're going to be led out by God's mighty hand, by the I am, okay? So then the text confronts us yet again. It says, okay, well, do you know him? It's not insignificant that Jesus, when he's responding to the criticism of the Pharisees, <clears throat> he says, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed for himself identity with God Almighty. And the Pharisees, they understood that, because what did they do at that point? They started picking up stones to stone him. That's blasphemy, that anyone would claim identity with God. Jesus is the great I am. And so the question is, well, do you know him? Do you know this God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the one whom Moses encounters there at the burning bush? Do you know Christ, the Messiah, is he your God? Secondly, the question then, is he your king? In Psalm 145, God presents himself as the I am, yes, and then as king. He has authority. Now David, writing this psalm, David's a king, and he's a mighty king, right? He's a big shot in that area, but he knows his place, right? There is above David and all peoples, a mighty king. And he is God. He is Yahweh. He is this mighty king, and his kingdom, unlike the kingdoms of earthly kings, his kingdom is what? It says an everlasting kingdom, right? And his dominion, it doesn't just endure for a decade or two or five or ten. No, his dominion endures through all generations. An everlasting kingdom dominion enduring through all generations. Does it sound familiar? How about the announcement of Gabriel to Mary, right, that Luke records in the first chapter, Luke 1, 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So also last week, Ivy leads us uh, in the text there in Mark concerning Jesus' triumphal entry right, into Jerusalem. What's the message that all the disciples are reciting? 
What are they saying? They're saying, here is the coming Messiah who will reign on the throne of David. Right? Christ is king, all right, because he's God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're one. And so Scripture declares of Jesus what? He is the image of the invisible God, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. For in him, in Christ, all things were created. Okay, so when you read in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Son of God is the agent of creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things are in subjection to Christ. Christ is king. And so in Revelation 19, right, you want to skip to the end? Get the, uh, you know, the end of the story? What is it? Christ is proclaimed, King of kings, Lord of lords. He is faithful and true. He is the word of God, King of kings. So God alone is king, Christ is king, and he's to be praised. He alone is worthy of our praise. He shares his glory with no one. No man, no thing, no person. He shares his glory with no one. To exalt Christ however, is to give God his due because Christ is God. So, another challenge, right? Who or what are you worshiping? Are you worshiping God Almighty? Are you worshiping Christ? Right? What do you treasure? I guess we could ask it that way, right? What do you treasure? What consumes you? How could we test that question, I guess, right? What could we do? Well, I suppose we could maybe open our checkbook right? Where's your money going? Yeah, there are lots of necessities and whatever else, but does your checkbook demonstrate that perhaps you're worshiping something else? Right? How about your speech? What comes out of your mouth? Is your speech effusive of God and what he's done in your life? Or does it show an obsession with something worldly? If you had a little cap with the uh, camera, right? You see that every now and then on TV, Kind of makes me seasick, right? Someone's got a cap, right? Well, if you had a cap with a camera there, right? What would you be showing to those who are viewing? What are you watching? The psalmist challenges us with that question, right? Who or what is it that we praise? So rightly ordered praise has a subject as well. It has an object. It is God Almighty. It has a subject, the one or the ones doing the praising, right? And so first, in the psalm, in some real sense, truly all creation praises God, right? The psalmist says what? All your works praise you, Lord. In Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem, the Pharisees are on his back. They're saying, Jesus, tell your disciples to shut up. Stop proclaiming this business about you being the Messiah and all. Right? The Pharisees want it silenced. What does Jesus say? Look, if they're silent, the rocks will cry out. Right? Creation, in some real sense, praises the Creator. In its beauty, in its splendor, its immensity, its power, the creation proclaims God. Paul gets to this in his letter to the Romans in the first chapter. Paul's describing the sad state of affairs, how human beings trade the knowledge of God, give it away. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what is made, what has been made, so that men are without excuse. There are plenty of very vocal atheists out there Right? They write books that get a lot of copies sold and whatever else. Right? They fancy themselves wise, philosophers of the age who really know the truth. There is no God, they say. God scoffs. The man, the woman who says there is no God, Scripture says, is what? A fool. Because he or she denies what is plain to see. The reality is that There are many. It is human nature to pay homage not to God, but to something else, to ourselves, to idols, whatever else. But 
The reality is the wicked refuse to pay homage. They reject God's kingship. And so in the second chapter in Psalms, we read, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Right? Again, you just see that in our culture, the idea, hey, let's just let loose of this, this God concept, and let's just kind of do what man can really do. If only we would just get rid of religion, and there is some truth there. Religion in and of itself doesn't save. God does. But let's just get rid of that, and then we can just thrive. We can flourish, right? The rebellion, however, is doomed to failure. God's reign cannot be thwarted. And so the psalmist continues in chapter 2. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Now God is gracious. Right? What does scripture say? It says, God is patient. Right? He doesn't will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So even to the kings who fancy themselves so wise in the notion that they ought to just simply free themselves from the bondage to uh, this God, God extends his grace. He says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed, here's God's grace, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Right? And so here in Psalm 145, the psalm says what? The Lord is near to all who call on him. But there's a qualification there, isn't there? Right? Did you catch that? To all who call on him what? In truth. Right? We don't come to God on our own terms. No, the Lord is near to all who call on him, but it must be in truth. And so when God says, you're a sinner, in truth we say, God, you're exactly right, I am a sinner. When God says, you can't solve your sin problem, we say, you're exactly right, God, I can't. It's beyond the realm of my power, whatever that may be. When God says there's but one way that your sin problem be dealt with, right? what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, right? When God says there's one way, then in truth we say, you're exactly right, and he is Jesus, okay? The world says, okay, yeah, we got some problems, but I tell you what, you know, you just go, go your path, and we're all going to get there at the same point in the end. Follow Buddha, follow Krishna, follow yourself, whatever, but, you know, just focus on the good, and we'll all get there. Again, the Lord scoffs. It is a denial of his truth. So the Lord is near to all who call on him. That's exactly right, but all who call on him in truth. God desires, God has been working from even before the creation of the world to constitute for himself a faithful people. Maybe in your translation it reads saints. A faithful people. People who extol God. They do so first through prayer. Right In this psalm, you see a prayer being uttered, right? Direct, one-on-one -on -one communication between the psalmist and God. The psalmist says what? I will exalt you. I will praise you. Extol your name. I will proclaim your great deeds. The eyes of all look to you. You give them their food. You open your hand, right? Prayer is critical, and the psalmist demonstrates that. Yet again, another challenge from Psalm 145. Do we pray? When we pray, do we praise God? Or is it just a matter of bringing a laundry, laundry list of things we think are wrong that just need to be corrected ASAP? Again, God is not indifferent to your needs. Far from it. Jesus says, no, cast all your cares on me, right? So God's not indifferent to human need, but God understands that if we begin with our need, we're going to move in the wrong direction. No, we begin with God. Do we praise God? Do we pray God? Pray to God? Do we praise Him in the process? My prayers need more of God and less of me. 
That's my conclusion as I read through this psalm. My prayers need more of God and less of me. Second, God's people extol him through meditation, right? Verse 5, the psalmist writes what? I will meditate on your wonderful works, right? In Joshua, first chapter, the commandment is what? Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Do we meditate on God's word? Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, starts right off. Blessed is the man whose what? Delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Do we meditate on the things of God? Do we set aside time to contemplate God and his commandments? And so I read through that, and I say, you know, my thought life needs more of God and less of me. Thirdly, praise comes out through God's faithful people, through his saints, just in their very speech, just in their very speech, right? May come in various forms, right? In this particular psalm, first of all, you see instruction. One generation commends your works to another. There is a responsibility to pass on the knowledge of God to the next generation. And so first and foremost, whose responsibility is that? The quarrels with your children? Right. Pastor Clay's responsibility? Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. God tells his people what? Impress the commandments. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Right? Throughout life, there are plenty of opportunities to communicate the knowledge of God, not just in the setting of corporate worship, not just in the youth group or C2 kids. The responsibility, first and foremost, is to parents. Fathers in particular, here it is, okay? Scripture lays it down very clear. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. Christian fathers must bring their children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So fathers, have you farmed that out to your wife? Have you farmed that out to the church? Have you farmed that out to Coral? I mean, I love what they do in C2 Kids. I love the ministries that we have here, the youth group. They are great, and they are indeed supplementary in a major way to this project of passing on the knowledge of God to the next generation. But the primary responsibility is in the home, and in particular fathers. Do we live up? Do we carry out that instruction? It's a blessing. It's an opportunity. It takes work. It takes time. Are we opening up the scriptures every day with our children? Do they see mom and dad reading the word? Do they see mom and dad praying? Do they see mom and dad communicating, talking about the things of God? Now the reality is, is there are many homes where perhaps the child is the first to come to faith. Praise God. And often when a child comes to faith, you'll see parents convicted and come to faith as well. But for those of you who fancy yourselves Christians living in a Christian home, Parents, are you communicating godly instruction to your children? That is the challenge from the psalmist. What is it okay that we can tell with this instruction, right? This psalm, you just see this constant, your mighty works, your awesome works, right? Boy, you know, where to start, right? In the Gospel of John, right at the end, John says, you know, Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing, Jesus did a whole lot of things. And if I was going to write them all down, there's just not enough room in the whole world to fill the library that could be written. The point being what? God's works are mighty and they are many. Okay? Just a couple. First thing on this, creation. Just the fact of creation. The fact that we are even here. It's interesting. Scientists, you know, the more that they peer out into the universe, they just realize not only how expansive, how massive this universe is, but how inhospitable it is. Just the mere probability of having a planet that can support life, it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing, okay? So I've got a little chart here. Tyler is doing a great job. By the way, Tyler, thank you very much. If there's any lapse, if I'm getting off track or whatever, I guarantee you it's not Tyler's fault, it's my own. But I've got this little chart here, okay? Anybody take statistics in high school or college or anything? All right. Anybody loves statistics? Okay. <laughs> I'm a nerd, and I am in that category. 
Statistics, okay, you flip a coin. What's the chance of it coming up heads? 50%, one out of two, okay. Found this interesting, uh, August edition of the DenverPost.com. What's the probability of the Broncos winning the Super Bowl? They put it at one in four. 25%, okay, sorry, Bill. What's the probability of a 100-year flood? Well, one in 100, right? One in 100 years. What are the chances of being struck by lightning? <clears throat> they say one in a million, right? You start getting a lot of these zeros, and then the mathematicians have to go to a short form of notation. So that's 10 to the 6, meaning six zeros there, right? What's the probability of becoming president? You live in the United States, you're a citizen. What's the probability? They peg it at one in 10 million. Okay. There is hope. Sorry. What's the probability of winning the uh, lottery, right? The, uh, what are they called, Powerball or jackpot or whatever, right? It is one in what? 175 million, okay? That's 1.7 times 10 to the 8, okay? What's the probability of winning it twice? They say, man, one in 24 trillion, okay? That's 12 zeros, okay? 12 zeros, okay? Now, what's the probability of finding in this massive universe a planet that can support life. Well, the best guess is this. One in 10 to the 282, okay? That is, one in one chance in one million, trillion, 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 okay? Tyler, you can edit the tape. Feel free to take some of that out. But, you know, you get the point. It's just completely improbable. But with God, all things are possible. Okay? God's mighty works, just the fact of creation. Just the, take it down just a little bit, just, just the, the amazing thing that is the human body. Okay? In its form, you know, how you go from one cell to about what? 37, I think it's, was it 37 billion or trillion cells, I think, in the human body, right? Okay. Yeah, some way out figure there, okay? Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Bears. Okay, so you go from one cell to all these other cells, and in the process, what happens? You get tissues formed. You get organs formed, and next thing you know, you have an organism that is functioning, right? In its function, the body is just amazing. You know, parents, aren't you glad that when you send your kid to school in the morning, you don't have to say, remember to breathe. <laughs> don't forget, for your, don't, don't forget to, to make sure your heart beats, right? Boy, just the, the human body is just amazing, Okay. In Scripture, we read of creation, we read of the Exodus, we've already uh, talked about that, the incarnation, the mirror, just the mystery of how it is that God Almighty weds himself to human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Miraculous, amazing. The empty tomb, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then comes judgment, the Scripture says, right? Jesus lies not in a tomb, but he sits at the right hand of the Father. The empty tomb is... Miraculous, a wonderful work. Perhaps on a more experiential level, then, we can go to the last one that I've thought about, which is just the miracle of a sinner saved by grace. Right? God demonstrates his love for us how? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? The, the fact that a sinner who has no desire for the things of God we all, like sheep, have gone astray, Scripture says. The fact that God would save and does save, a miraculous work. Okay, with God, all things are possible. So within our speech, in this psalm, we see instruction. We see exhortation. Let every creature praise his holy name. Right? So there's celebration. There's singing. Man, I just love it. I mean, I love to, love to play the keyboard when I get a chance, but I just love to be out there praising while the praise team is up leading us in praise. There are times in life, there are stages in life that call for somberness, that call for reflection, that call perhaps for a dirge, if you will. But the norm, the norm of our praise, the norm of our singing ought to be what? Celebration. Joyful. Right? 
Not manufactured, and it's not. It's genuine up here. Celebrating, joyous singing. We see the speech also in the form of evangelistic utterance, right? Why is it, verse 12, that God's people are telling of his kingdom, that are speaking of his might? The psalmist says, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Right? The purpose is not for us just to sit comfortable in our lazy chairs and be content just with our own salvation. There is great joy in that fact alone, absolutely. But our hearts should be burdened for those around us. Would you agree? Absolutely. Right? And so the psalmist brings yet another challenge, right? What is it? Does our speech bear witness to God? Does it introduce people to the king? Does it build up other believers? Does it exhort them to greater love and passion for God? Conversely, is my speech focused on me and my agenda? Right? When I speak, do people just cringe thinking, oh, here it goes again? Again, there is need to communicate genuine uh, needs and concerns from one brother or sister to another. I don't make light of that. But what is it that our speech bears witness to as the norm? Again, I conclude, my speech needs more of God and less of me. Third point, rightly ordered praise. It has an object, has a subject, and it has specific content. Okay? Praise begins with God and his glory and not man and his need. That's what Alistair Begg says, and I think he's exactly right. right? God has given us the content. We find it in Scripture, right? For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding, right? God communicates to us through Scripture for a purpose, right? That we would be made wise for salvation through faith in Christ and that which on account of the divine origin, on account of the fact that Scripture has God as its primary author, as its sole author, truly, it is then, what, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture gives us the content of praise, and we see that content uh, uh, summarized or uh, attributed here in this particular psalm. Verse 3, God's infinite great greatness on display. Verses 4 and 6, his mighty power. Verses 7 and 8, his goodness. Verse 8, his mercy. Verse 13, his sovereignty. Verse 13 and 17, his faithfulness. And verse 7 and 17, his righteousness. So we see the attributes of God on display, his activity as well. Verses 1 through 13, he is active. He is the king. Verses 9 and 10, he's the creator. Further on down, he is depicted as sustainer, provider, helper, protector, savior, God hears their cry, and he saves them. Right? And then what? God as judge, verse 20. The wicked he will destroy. The reality is, is that we are all on one of two paths. Either we are, by God's grace, on the path to salvation, or we're on the path to eternal condemnation and separation from God. That's the reality, okay? We can... You know, you can look out across the mass of humanity and you see that people are doing all kinds of things. But in reality, we're either on one, we're on one of two paths. Right? It's appointed unto men once to die. We're all going to die. I'm thankful for doctors. Got a brother who's one. Thankful for the medical profession. I'm thankful when they can uh, function to alleviate our suffering and extend life. That's a great thing. But they're not miracle workers. Yes, God may use them in certain times to perform what appears to be a miracle and may very well be. But the reality is, is a doctor can work on you and work on you and work on you. Sooner or later, you're going to die. Okay? It's appointed unto men once to die. And then after that, what? Judgment. Either we'll be found in Christ or not. Okay? Scripture proclaims very clearly all have sinned, okay? So we start off on the wrong path. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And the wages of sin is what? 
death, eternal separation from God, right? So we cannot stand and say, you know, God, you're just being unfair. I mean, how is it this, this God would send people to hell? I don't know, in sharing Christ with others, perhaps that's come up. It has when I've uh, talked with some folks. I just want nothing to do with this God who sends people to hell. You get what's going on there. The finger is pointing what? From man to God. And God says, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Because that, that argument is fundamentally the notion that somehow I'm just good enough and that God's got it wrong. Apparently his standard of justice is, uh, just doesn't hit the mark. No, uh-uh. Let God be true and every man a liar. God doesn't leave it there, though. We know that. That is the good news. That is the euangelion. That is the good news of Christ. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to stay in your sin. Salvation is fully a work of God. God brings our mind to the recognition that we are sinners. Again, deep down we know that because his law is written on the hearts of all people. We know we're sinners. We know we really can't solve our problems. Yeah, we try, but usually we just make it a lot worse than, than it already is. So the sin problem is beyond our ability to solve the debt. The wages of sin, too great to pay. Jesus steps in. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's the good news. Praise God. So, the challenge then, the opportunity then, is to set your mind on the things above, just as Clay said in his pastor's perspective earlier in the week. Psalm 145 gives a great opportunity for that. My counsel to you is that this week, do yourself a favor. Turn off the tube and open the Word. Explore the riches of God's Word. Fill yourself with the knowledge of God. Again, stop imbibing at the watering hole of the world that fills you up with a bunch of garbage. Okay? Meditate on God's character and His works. And then don't keep it to yourself. Tell what God has done. In word and deed, again, they always need to go together. In word and deed, proclaim the greatness of God that others would come to know Christ as God the King. We hope you'll come join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather every week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere and celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross Culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships. A community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person. Real people who truly care. Solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens. And the most energetic, safe, and fun kids program around. Find out more at crossculturelife.org. I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.